Howdy gang and welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McLear, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. Thanks for joining me once again. Earlier today, I had the pleasure of speaking with Davis Chenault, Stephen Chenault, and Chuck Combo from Troll Lord Games, as well as Luke Gygax. And there was some big news that was announced on Wednesday from Troll Lord Games about some Gary Gygax material that is going to be returning to print. It's pretty exciting. And without further ado, let's jump right to that interview. All right, so who wants to kick it off? Well, uh, I can't not me. <laughs> I can kick it off. So uh, my name is Stephen Schnauth. I'm the CEO of Troll Lord Games, and we're here today to talk about uh, uh, the very big announcement that we had on Wednesday. I think is when we announced it. It's been a it's been a flurry of <laughs> of activity since then, but uh, the some of the properties for Gary Gygax were released. Uh, and we'll be we'll be Troller Games will be publishing those and working with the Gygax family to bring some of this stuff back and hopefully in the future even more of this stuff back to the uh, to the gaming table. So this was something that uh, we were discussing during my live show last night, and I know there were a lot of people out there who were pretty excited to because uh, I guess I think you did a video uh, that uh, you made the announcement that. Uh, is it uh, pronounced Zagig? Castle yeah. Zagig? Castle Zagig, that's right. <laughs> I know what it is. I just wasn't sure if I was pronouncing it correctly. The correct? Yeah, that's right. And it, is it supposed to be? Drow. It's drow, oh. not drow. So there you go. So oh, yeah. All those questions. Now, does it yeah. not mean in, in, in drow? Does that not mean Greyhawk, correct? No. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that is one of the translations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we know it doesn't mean Blackmore, so yeah. That's, okay. <laughs> that's right, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so a lot of people were really excited to hear about this. I'll be the first to point out that I did not have an opportunity to watch the video, so we're going to talk about uh, the big announcement. I know we've got uh, Davis, Steven, uh, we've got Luke Gygax, which I had not had an opportunity to, uh, to meet before today. Saw so, you yeah, Gary Khan this past year, but didn't say hello to you then either. I just saw you. Yeah. So I, I'm oftentimes running around uh, uh, trying to get stuff done at, at Gary Khan. It's my busiest four days of my life uh, every year. Oh, I believe it. I, I'd like to go up to Luke at Gary Khan and say, do you have a minute? Because I know he does. <laughs> <laughs> I bet the thoughts are more than a penny, too. So, so, so the big announcement is that we're going to see a return to Troll Lord games of many of the uh, adventures and settings that Gary Gygax originally created for Troll Lord games, right? Well, so uh, two parts to that. First off, um, we've only been given three items. The, the, the judge has only given us three items, the Gigsburg, the Hermit, and the Gygax and Fancy World Series. There's a, an absolute treasure trove of material beyond that. Oh, sure. To tap. But he really didn't, and I want to just be clear, Gary Gygax didn't write it for Troller Games. He wrote all of this material, and we published it for him. So we were his primary publisher from 2000 to 2008. Right. When he crossed over. Um, but, yeah, it is an absolute plethora of material. I mean, the, mater the amount of material is just, it's staggering. It's massive. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one thing my dad was able to do was produce content. He was very, very good at doing that. And I tell you what, it's not easy. And I asked him, I said, how do you like, what's the secret? And he's like, there is no secret. I get up in the morning at like six o'clock and I sit down at the, used to be a typewriter, I think at the time when he told me that, and I go. And I just have to force myself to keep going. And he said, it gets easier over time and your stuff gets better over time, but there is no secret. You just put it, it's like anything else, put in 10,000 hours, you're gonna be an expert, right? And, and that's what he did. And by the time he was in his 60s, uh, he was, you know, he wasn't in great physical health, but man, mentally, uh, he was just a voracious reader uh, and, and could articulate ideas and concepts like nobody's business. I mean, he was really a master uh, in that craft. I mean, he's, he's a legend. I mean, there's, there's reasons why he was a guest star on Futurama. 
<laughs> yeah. 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 He had so much fun doing that, by the way. That was that was a real highlight. <laughs> oh, I'm for him. sure he loved it. Yeah, and, and uh, more... one of the guys that was on uh, that wrote for uh, uh, Futurama became eventually the senior uh, writer on Big Bang Theory, which is why they featured Gary Khan in an episode, uh, yeah, like at Gary Khan six or seven. Oh, okay. Yeah, and and so it was featured in there. Uh, uh, Sheldon was trying to get a ride from Penny to go to Gary Khan because he wanted Dragon T-shirts. My website for Gary Khan crashed because there were 600 wow. people on there, like like every second there was wow. like in there, and it just crushed my it crushed my story. And of course, I had no online store at that time. We we're just a tiny little convention that was the thing. So I don't know. I, I missed my my great opportunity with the <laughs> most popular uh, comedy show uh, in the world at that time. Uh, Nobody could have given Khan. you a heads up about this. No, it's not. They, that's what I said. I was like, <laughs> not like it was a live broadcast. <laughs> I was like Eric Kaplan. You could have just said something, bro. Come on. Yeah, but uh, it happened. Yeah, they I'd just like wanted, to point out want to Gary... drive your site down. That's what it was. That's it was all. They're yes, to it's break a conspiracy. the server. <laughs> uh, we're the yes, we're the targets of a vast conspiracy. Uh, <laughs> on Gary Khan. Damn Sorry. you, Big Bang Theory. <laughs> So let's talk about these upcoming releases. I should I take a guess we're going to see these crowdfund? Hey, do you want me to tackle that, Luke? Or I just say, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Steve, uh, you know, Steve came up with a, a concept of making, uh, you know, what the stuff has been off the market for fifteen years, right? And there it goes are... for big bucks on the secondary market. It, I know yeah. that. It, I know why true. a lot of people are excited. <laughs> Because they're it like, does. I don't want to pay five hundred dollars for Eggsburg or whatever. Exactly, it, was, right? it, it does, it does. But I would just like to say that I have a couple of these in my library, oh, and uh, there will be a difference. There will be a different well, logo and a different sure. number. So this is the original. So I, <laughs> we could still part with this for the right number. He's looking. Saying. He's looking for investors um, right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I would suggest uh, everyone with those original copies wrap them up. Yeah. And put them aside. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, they, yeah, they, they will be valuable to death. They're probably falling apart in people's collections. Hopefully, yeah. because that's yeah, how they should. Think. That's how they should be used. I know all my my dad gave me one of each of the you know his books. Uh, you know my monster manual stuff like that. But believe me, they are battered and loved because that's the books I used. He didn't give me like mm -hmm. here's your play copy, son, and here's the one I signed for. Like here's your <laughs> one copy. Right. Go for it. Right. That that was it. And we played with it. I mean, I have like his coffee mug ring on some of them and that sort of stuff, but they're well-loved and that's, it's not like I'm ever going to sell them regardless. Uh, but for right. us, you know, Steve and I chatted about it and we approached the estate to get uh, you know, with a plan of uh, which they approved. And that is to immediately get some reprints into circulation. Uh, and we started with one that is, that is very important. It's the environs around Castle Zagig. It's um, the East Mark and the city of Yigsburg, uh, which is not, uh, anything similar to Greyhawk, uh, the city of Greyhawk in, in Britain, completely different. It does, though, interestingly enough, have a fold-out map. Completely different done, world. Yeah, done by Darlene, who happened to also make the Greyhawk map, but these are coincidental uh, coincidental <laughs> things. Um, so, yes, Igsburg, uh, it's great. It's the environs around there. 256 pages, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and just, you know, clearly one of my dad's favorite uh, pieces that he put together and something that he noodled around over you know many decades um and that's that's what you got uh then the second piece uh also to help us rapidly uh, generate cash for the estate because there's a lot of debts to be taken care of after all this time uh and another favorite and uh piece that stands out in in his work is the hermit which is a a, a shorter adventure i think it's 60 pages i can't yeah remember. about, about, about 50, 50 pages so yeah yeah 50, 60 pages, somewhere in that region. And so we're going to get, that's to help satisfy, and, and it's, it's to get excitement generated for his fans and hopefully to reach out to the millions of new players that have come around since he passed away and since all his stuff's been out of circulation, introduce this to him, get their appetite whetted. In January sometime, uh, very likely, we'll, uh, Troll Lords will be doing a Kickstarter to bring out the seven volumes of the Gygaxian Fantasy World, which is... Uh, basically, techniques, uh, tactics, and procedures for how to build and run an excellent campaign world, right? And one of the favorite ones that my dad talked about forever and ever is this beauty right here, the Canton Crew. Uh, just a wonderful uh, resource for your thieves, rogues adventures. 
Uh, I just remember him uh, speaking thieves can't to me all the time <laughs> for like, <laughs> for like weeks. And I was like, what? Yeah, it was. And I was like, oh man, what's going on? And he was like making up hand and arm signals and all this sort of stuff. So just tons of tons. Of, it's great in here. If you're running like a city campaign or something, it's all right in there. It's beautiful stuff. Uh, so that'll come out in January. And we're hoping, we're hoping that uh, uh, by successfully introducing this, by proving that there is an appetite out there for his fans, uh, that troll lords, that uh, we can partner, the state can continue to partner with troll lords, where my dad produced a lot of materials and there is Castle Zagig part, you know, already underway before, yeah. before he died and the license was pulled. Uh, there is a lot of material there that we can get started with again, right? And we can continue on, uh, which was my father's plan. He had people picked out. Uh, he knew he was he knew he wasn't going to live, right? He he knew his days were numbered, right. and uh, he knew this for some time. And he put people in place, and he said, "This is your area. Here's the overview. R start writing." And he did that, and he sectioned it out to everybody, and he established uh, Jeff Talanian as kind of his his over you know, the guy who'd provide continuity across mm -hmm. the entire uh, the entire project. Now, of course, that was 15 years ago. And uh, Jeff is a very talented designer, and he has his own company, Northwind Adventures, and makes yeah. a wonderful game called Hyperborea. Hyperborea. Yeah, yeah. yeah, good stuff. Great game. Third and, edition, and, by the way, everybody. Yes, he just did the third edition, and Jeff's a great guy. And I, 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 I love Jeff. He's a friend, and he comes to GaryCon, and he's very supportive. But I completely understand he has a business to run. He has his own <laughs> brand. I don't right. think he can come back and do that. I'm hoping that Jeff will be able to uh, consult in some way if we get to this point. That Jeff would be willing to to step in and consult and help guide whomever uh, kind of steps into that role as an overarching, overarching, you know, the orchestrator, the conductor of this uh, 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 of this uh, Magnus Opus uh, that my dad left incomplete, uh, but with a lot of how to finish it. So yeah, I think he had finished uh, kind of that's the goal. Yeah, we had we had published the first five levels of Castle Zaggy, and I and I know he had planned a, a total of seventeen, but that was open ended for him. Zoinks! Yeah, so there's another twelve that need to be hammered out. Did he have? Uh, are, are you sure are it was you, seventeen? Are you I guess he had laid out the idea for all of them, but did he have writers for those as well? Did he? No, so he so each of the writers that, that Luke was talking about was over part of Vigsburg in the East Mark, and they were developing that. Yeah. He yeah. and Jeff were writing yeah. the whole Castle's Agate stuff, uh, and they had finished the upper works. I, I've got the box names. He had already had the box names for all the first three or four boxes of what it was. But what Luke was alluded to a second ago, uh, I, I accidentally put out in a press release the 17 levels of Castle's Agate, <laughs> and I got a rather terse email back from him that said, oh, are you now the master of Castle Zagig? You're deciding how many levels it has? <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> I had to recant my press release. Because <laughs> yeah. I think he really just wanted to keep going as long as, you know, as long as his imagination would go. But yeah, Davis, it was, it was, it was Gary and Jeff that were doing the, and Peter Bradley was deeply involved with the Castle Zagig. Because it's got... Because well, the, mapping, the, the mapping is so yeah. critical. <laughs> Yeah, the mapping is insane because he was very, very insistent. I remember these emails. I, I didn't really participate in the discussions, but I, I was CC'd in, you know, so I could see what's going on um, on some of them. But he wanted ramps and ladders and staircases to go from level one to level seven, from level three to level nine. You know, he wanted it like it would be someone actually built this thing and was using it. Uh, it yeah, was I going remember to be looking at the notes he sent over one time for the uh, layout of the whole dungeon. And it was really complex, the connections between all the levels. And I remember sitting there looking at it and thinking, this is going to be a mapping nightmare. <laughs> it was. Can I, can I, 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 I want to say one thing. Clearly, it rubbed off on you and your game design. That's all I'm going to say, Mr. Smith. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I'm going to say. I would say that Gary is an inspiration for a lot of my... Uh, yes design techniques yes and i really love the way he did npcs so if you take the village of hamlet and multiply it by 100 you get igsburg but the npcs in hamlet alone each one could create an adventure in igsburg you have something like a thousand npcs there's literally thousands of adventures that you could have it's tons of you know david that alone. 
as a side note, I'm running a game right now, Castles and Sage game for low level adventures and they're coming out of the city of Ascalon. And I'm using the village of Hamlet as the kind of the center point where the, the adventures are taking place. So Davis and I started gaming back in the 70s and Davis bought the village of Hamlet when it first came out. And I'm using his copy that he had then. And then the margins are filled with notes, names and motivations and all of these NPCs are <laughs> given even more than was put in this. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's sort of sad that I, I wasn't really a collector. I collected comics, comics at the time, but I never bought double copies of anything related to Dungeons and Dragons at that point, uh, with probably a few exceptions. And I'm a prolific note taker and I'm horrible with books. Oh, yeah, I treat you're... them like books. And I've got his no original monster thing. book, the Monster mm -hmm. Manual you bought at Sears. I was with you when you bought it for ten dollars, <laughs> I think, or nine, whatever, nine ninety yeah. nine, whatever. Nine ninety five. Nine ninety five. And the spine, and this is this will tell you the quality of TSR books. The okay. spine is gone, right? All of the the wrap around the spine is completely gone, but the the threading for the signatures is still there, and that book is one hundred percent intact and usable. So it just doesn't have a spine anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> TSR made some fantastic quality books. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the um, the plan for the material that's already been written and the material that's going to be fleshed out. Because I think it's probably important for people who are checking out this interview to know that there are hundreds upon hundreds of pages of content that's good to go. That's right. Yes. I mean, it's just has probably be touched up a little bit to bring it like you know into our modern era but i mean there's tons of stuff so one thing i i think people may not realize is that they're going to see a lot of content in a relatively short period of time it's not 10 you know, years down the line no yeah we, we yeah we, no we, it's not going to take yeah if we get approval for some more projects and i'm fairly certain that we will there is a, uh, I looked through my files and I think I have seven finished pieces that never saw publication. They were sitting in our, uh, they were just sitting in files waiting to be mm -hmm. published. And then there's others that we did publish. Like, did we get to the ounce in? So yes, the ounce in, yes, that was, then there, we put four of the city adventures out, but there's things like Hall of Many Pains. There's a, a slew of adventures for legendary adventures. Uh, there's just, there's a, a, a whole many pains itself is, if I recall, it was three books, about 200 pages of book. Uh, and that stuff, that material is finished. There's no, you know, yeah, it, it's, it's done. So there is a, a lot of material Now we've got to get into it, you know, sit down with Luke and figure out what the plan going forward is. And of course we got to get approval from the estate for whatever we want to do. Uh, but probably commission some additional artwork. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there'd be d several ways of approaching this, but but I would imagine we'd want to make a lot of things full color as opposed to black and white yes. interior, yes. And, and, yes. and and maybe bundle some things together or whatever whatever it is, you know. But I believe it's box sets for uh, how many box sets were there for Castle Zagig? Was it five that were going to be done? I, I believe it was five levels per. And then one extra, so four, on just out the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in looking at my notes, I know some of this changed a little bit because I had seven covers. I had purchased seven covers, so I got to really dig in and see what his intent was that I can remember and and, and wedge up. I know Yigsburg was one of those covers. Uh, so yeah, it was minimally four, but I think it was five box sets for what he had developed, just for Castle Castle Zaggy. I keep wanting to say the other one, but <laughs> yeah, it, that it's not there. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, uh, Hall of Many Pains, I play tested that uh, way, way back when uh, as Legendary Adventures with my character Strix Tanager. It was uh, oh. in LA, but but um, uh, there's no reason that couldn't be ported into other systems. No, uh, no, no, that, to it. So that was a pretty cool adventure. Yeah, I, I like Hall of Penny Paint, Hall of Many Paints, as much as I like Igsburg. It's uh, again, it's Gary at his best, I think, with his and what it really explores is Gary's imagination. 
which appears to be limitless <laughs> uh, with the Hall of Many Pains. Everything is original. I mean, he's not revisiting the same thing again and again and again. And Hall of Many Pains just takes it to the next level. I really hope that we get that project as well. Yeah, that, that, but even beyond that, there was a, a World Builder 2 he was going to do. He wanted to redo the Canning Crew. There was two or three more Gygaxian fantasy worlds. There was fictions. They had how many Gordon novels? I think there were seven Gordon novels. We had published the first one, uh, so he wanted the Gordon novels back out, and we were doing hardcovers on all of those. There's the Tale of, Sam, uh, uh, Tale of Sammy or Sam, Sammy, Sammy. It's just all kinds of materials that, and not to even mention the the board game kings of england kings of france that's right um, but um yeah i mean it was just it, just a mountain too but there is there is a lot of material that's already done uh like luke davis have mentioned that it needs to be cleaned up new art new system hall of many paints came out as, as a dual statted d20 and legendary adventures uh so it need to be upgraded you know to a different system with probably new art i'm not sure that was uh we didn't a lot of that art was done with and Jeffrey Horn, is that his name? I can't remember, a good friend of Gary's, and I'm not sure if he's still in the biz and, and whatnot. So we'd have, yeah, it'd probably be a lot of new art, stuff like that. Yeah, it's, you know, like, but the, the the core is there. 80, 80 90% yeah. of the work is done. It's really edit, edit, you know, uh, stat changing uh, with an edit in there, relay it out with some, with some art, which is all important stuff, uh, but it's not huge delays. And you can probably have, several parallel projects working and then it would just be a release schedule right i mean how rapidly do you want to hit the right. market with everything you know uh <laughs> you, you got to space it out a little bit yeah here's What's one that davis is talking about the teeth of barkash nor oh, is an yeah. adventure module yep set in castle yeah. uh it's a looking at it right now it's a thirty-two thousand page adventure a thirty-two thousand word adventure so it's the thirty-two thousand page. <laughs> that'd be a lot of pages <laughs> <laughs> It's the Tolstoy of, uh, yeah. of adventures right there. It's just a lot of material. You like that 40-year-long campaign, kids? Sit down. We're going to play it right now. That's right. Get your kids while they're about 10, and they can finish when they're middle-aged. Right. They can finish it up with their grandchildren. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about system, because to me, I feel that there's probably no better fantasy role-playing game system out there that fits into the design theory of these upcoming re-releases and new releases than Castles and Crusades, because a lot of people love to refer to the role-playing game as what second edition Dungeons and Dragons would have been if Gary Gygax had designed it. Now, I don't know if I would go to that extent, but I... I tell people all the time, I've shared reviews of uh, various Castles and Crusades releases. I've done videos about why people should play it. And to me, it's got that old school feel that a lot of people enjoyed, but with newer, more modern mechanics. All right. And I think, so I think there's a real good reason why we're going to see this, uh, all this material coming out from Troll Lord Games and not say... Oh, I don't know, old school essentials or any number of OSR games that are out there. So what, one, there's two sides to that. First off, you're, you're spot on that uh, when we were developing Castles of Chase, one of the major motivations for it was to give Gary a platform for Castles Agic and his other material, but specifically for Castles Agic. And that's why you see the, the Yigsburg and the upper works are all written and designed for Castles Agic. He wanted it to be art for Castles and Chase. He wanted it to be in the same tone the same kind of tonal language that advanced dungeons and dragons was in because that's was his game of choice obviously sure uh, third edition had been out and he was he was happy with third edition except he thought it leveled up far too fast and that would kind of spoil some of what was what was unfolding in castles Aggie. so and and as davis and mac they're the designers of castles and says as, as they made rules they would send them to me uh, i was kind of the the idiot test if i couldn't understand it in one passover we had they had to rewrite it and then it went to gary so that he could see and make sure that it was going to fit his the, the tone he needed for for advanced Dungeons and dragons so that's certainly part of it that's certainly part of the history of all of this stuff going forward we're going to see what's going to happen but i know we're all very concerned 
couldn't, that's not the right word. We, we, we all want to get Gary's material in as many hands as humanly possible. I mean, this stuff is, it's beyond classic. It is, it's not even, I don't even like to refer it to that. I mean, it's, it's really fantastic gaming material. No matter what age you are, no matter what system you're playing, no matter where you're coming to the table from, uh, Yigsburg or, or the Upper Works or Hall of Many Pains or the Hermit or whatever it is, you know, it, it's, it's really class A quality material. So going forward, uh, we're going to sit down. I've got a couple of ideas that uh, I, I, I haven't actually run by Luke yet. Uh, we're going to see. Uh, but uh, it, definitely the spirit of Castles and Crusades is there without that. Well, and if you think about it, why is it Castles and Crusades? Because when my dad was a member of the International Federation of War Gamers, he had the yep. Castles and Crusades Society, right? So that's, it's clearly tied to, you know, my dad is ingrained in Castles and Crusades. It's a system he believed and loved, and, and it was kind of his comfortable style of play. However, as as Steve said, you know, and we're, this is all supposition, right? We, we don't have the authority to do any of this stuff, so it's sure. speculation <laughs> on our part. There's no guarantees, but if there were a great, you know, a large or really well done, you know, Swedish game system that would work or something else that, that would be able to, punk, you know, penetrate uh, a European market or an Asian market or a South American market, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you want to see that translate into those things and distributed, uh, you know, that way? I, I just, I would think from a, from a standpoint of the estate, it's a, the larger the audience that you can reach while maintaining quality, of course is is important so uh but yeah i think castles and crusades is the best fit in in my opinion for the material yeah in, in the design process uh so gary and i didn't talk a lot through email and when we talked in person we never talked about games or uh game design anything like that we talked history pretty much all the time uh and he was very well read very, very well read. I would compare him to any professor that I had in college about how read and how well read he was and how knowledgeable he was about history and his theories. Uh, and we were in sync on that. But with regards to the rules, as I was developing, Mac and I were developing those rules, I would contact Gary uh, about the various ideas that I had. And amazingly, we were on, we were in sync on a whole lot of them. So I would send him one. I remember the AC conversation that went very, very quickly because he was all in agreement about the AC, the, uh, you know, we went to the positive AC instead of the negative AC. That one really quick. The one where we uh, butted heads was the, uh, the night. And it, it was a few emails before he came, before I came back and realized, oh, that's what you're talking about. I get it now. Uh, so the night was developed. Uh, that was the one that we butted heads on. I think maybe the ranger too, because I, as I had originally wrote the ranger, it had magic. And Gary was Gary sent a long email explaining why that was a bad idea. It was a poor choice <laughs> for the ranger. But other than that, we were in sync a lot, and uh, I think that. And of course, I had to make it such that he was comfortable with everything, as was mentioned, and comfortable with the style of writing that he wanted to do and the type of play. And importantly, Kent pointed out that the level advancement uh, was too fast because it was his opinion that, one, when you're at first level or you're beginning play, you're learning. Not only are you learning the system, you're learning how to actually play. And Gary was a really challenging DM. He, uh, as you can see through his models, he was a very challenging DM. So he wanted the players not to advance that quickly so that they learned, could learn to actually play, for example, in a dungeon, how to deal with various traps, puzzles, and other things, and monsters, and work together. As Luke mentioned in the previous thing, it's the first uh, cooperative game. I think that was out there where the players have to work together to accomplish a goal. And then later he could introduce even more complex puzzles and traps and other, you know, other aspects of the, the higher level dungeons and the players themselves, not the characters necessarily, but the players themselves were up to the challenge. And that's one of the reasons for the slow advancement. Mm -hmm. uh, it also allows you to develop stories 
yeah. better. I think. It, do, it does. I think if you look at AD and D and you know the the way his style of play, you had to th- kind of consider your what your mission was, right, or anticipated mission, how you're going to strategize to work together and and overcome whatever obstacles you face, and and try to forecast the range of obstacles that you would that you would face, right, or, or challenges. And then during the adventure, it was resource management, right? Yes. Do I use this spell now? Am I going to use my potion, scroll, whatever it is? When are we liable to have a chance to rest? Do I, you know, uh, how much do we run into battle and fight it up close? Do we avoid it? Because, you know, guess what? Hit points don't come back after a short rest or whatever it is, you know, instantaneously heal. So uh, there's, it was a very different style of play. And, and I think it requires, and I, I, yeah, I don't want to be like an addition person or whatever, but I think it requires more planning and, and thought than, than you get in some other systems that, that we see that are very popular today. A different style of play, just like movies. When you watch movies, they're paced differently oh, from yeah. the 70s and 80s yeah. than today. Uh, or you look at board games. How many people are going to play a game, sit down and play a game of Titan with you nowadays? Not very likely, right? Oh, you got eight hours or 10 hours to play this game? Are you kidding me? They want a 90-minute game, and they're, they're yeah, well, of course. We're old, we're grognards, dude. We probably play. It. <laughs> but yeah, if you sit, if I sat down with my daughters, they'd be like, "No way, Dad, we're out of here." <laughs> <It's not happening. laughs> they're sitting there saying, 90 minutes now. I don't have that much time either." <laughs> yeah, that's true. yeah, I miss those days where we played uh, 12-hour games or yeah. even longer. I remember uh, when we were playing in Max Attic. And we had a 48-hour game. Oh, yeah. We just, It was nonstop gaming. And we would roll out because, you know, someone would get tired. And they would just roll out and go take a nap. So their character would disappear for a while. Uh, but we, did that, we didn't do that that long we, ago. We were actually gaming when Kathy, my wife, went into labor with my firstborn. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, hold on. I'm in the middle of a combat. Hold on. <laughs> I'll be there in a few minutes. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that night. That was funny. Yeah. But the, the upshot is uh, Castle of Zage is certainly going to be a part of this going forward. So uh, I, I thank all the CNC fans out there um, and, and and the spirit of Gary. I mean, that's he's he's everywhere in it. If you open the first page of the Player's Handbook, there is a big thank you to Gary Gygax. Um, it's, it's still there somewhere. So there's something else I want to mention real yeah, quick. Oh, I didn't even know I was muted. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say to add what Steve said, and you don't even know this, Steve, but um, in the last couple of days, I've already gotten emails from people wanting to run Yigsburg at Gary Con and at Virtual Greyhawk Con. They're already sending in requests to do that. So they could, the organized side is already starting to feel the impact of that too on our program. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. But yeah. Maybe we could revisit the Castle and Crusade Society and uh, have it running uh, Yigsburg. Oh, and all those cool. other modules that he created. Absolutely. That. that would be cool. So I was going to say very recently, a new print run of the player's handbook came out mm-hmm. for Castles and Crusades. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people out there who may not be familiar with Castles and Crusades may not realize all of the rules that you need to play are in that player's handbook. Yes. That's right. Yes. It's it's not broken up into the castle keeper's guide and the player's handbook. And I have to ask, is the player's handbook, the earlier print edition still available for free in PDF? Yeah. So we've got uh, on the website, you can, go, you can download it right now. The seventh printing of the player's handbook is up. You can snatch it. It's got all the rules. The rules have not changed since the first printing. Nope. Uh, the only thing we have changed is the barbarian. I went in and made him a little bit more barbaric and prim- primeval, and I changed the name of the monk's abilities to a more kind of English version of things like Death Strike and stuff like that. Uh, beyond that, some spells were added. Now we do have the tenth. We're working on the tenth printing now, uh, and we will be removing the OGL from it. Uh, so there's going to be some re. Stuff, everything's going to stay the same. The rules are still the same. Everything's the same. You can play any. Any player's handbook, you're good to go at the table. But we're redoing the spells, re-envisioning the spells the way we lay them out and uh, some of the content along those lines. But, uh, yeah, you can absolutely go get a, this. And, in fact, now I've, I've done it again, Chuck. I took the monster book. You did? I was getting ready to say that. Oh, my gosh. So it, so you can go to the website and you can download the player's handbook and the third printing of the monster book. Yeah. But I keep 
I keep taking the monster book off the featured product page for some idiotic reason. So you're going to have to look for it. <laughs> it is on the site somewhere. Yeah, we, we basically, we give our game away for free. I mean, technically. Right. So we don't. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's why I wanted to mention, because you're talking about these upcoming releases. Right. Hey, it's a perfect time for people to check out Castles and Crusades absolutely free. Yeah, you can go pick up, you can pre-order Yigsburg right now. Uh, we're going to be shipping hopefully in about six weeks. Uh, and right to the left of it is the player's handbook. So you can put your pre-order in for Yigsburg and um, support the whole uh, Gary Gygax coming back thing and download the player's handbook and start start game. Everything you need is in there. Now, I will say, uh, starting with the 8th printing, and we still have some of those to sell, but um, the 8th and 9th printing are they they just look beautiful. They're just beautiful books. <laughs> we I love the them. homage covers. In fact, the yeah, I see. Yeah, I see one behind He's you. He's got one back there hanging up back there. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. And that Peter Bradley did great. That's Jason Walton did those covers, and Peter Bradley did a fantastic yeah. job on the layout. Uh, it's just it's it's funny looking yes. at it. I'm gonna, we got a new store launching. Yes, we got a new store launching very very soon. I tried right. to get it up before the Yigsburg uh, announcement, but. I, I missed it by a few hours. But one of the things that we're going to add to the store is the history of each product. That's right. And I'm looking really forward to writing the history of the player's handbook because I remember when the first first printing arrived in my driveway and four big pallets all shrink wrapped. And I remember opening it and I, and I looked at that cover and I thought, this is more yellow than it was supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> but, but too late now. Yeah, too late now. <laughs> so 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 funny story uh i remember hanging up a poster of the monster manual uh cover in in my room and uh on each side of it were two giant white bars like the the bottom oh. was good but was good. and it's because back in the old days you laid it out there was like right some it, yeah. it, 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 right. The, it, the printer just took it as is didn't figure out that he should add you know like stretch it or whatever and just right. include those white bars my dad was furious oh my god he was so <laughs> mad at those guys so i could just imagine you know yeah yeah he was he, that was him 78 or something it's, like it's so, good to know that he also had the same problems that we did yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was gonna say and oh god i find like typos on shit after i uh or on stuff oh. after i uh after I, and i'm like oh, yeah. i was when i throw the book across the room and it's like that's when i realized no matter how many times i read it or whatever yeah. I need a fresh set of eyes and editor to read Always. that stuff. I'm just, I, I yeah. can't do it. Uh, but, but you said you mentioned Castle Crusades, picking it up and trying it. A barrier to entry for most people is I don't want to learn another game system. Hell no. I don't want to do right. it. Guess what? If you play AD&D, you, you, you can learn Castles and Crusades very, very easily. If you uh, play 5th edition D&D, you can easily that, learn. And that is exactly my point. The Siege Engine looks a lot like what 5e is doing right with their difficulty checks and that sort of stuff so mm. very very similar and and what castles of crusades was it's on its 20th anniversary now or something next like year that? Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so 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 yeah so uh if you're playing either one of those systems very very easy to jump into castles of yeah. Crusades. yeah i would also like to mention that uh if you pick up the for those of you out there and there may be very few of you very, not very few of you but very few of these left the first printing of Castles and Crusades is still a, it's nothing's changed from that first printing. Yeah. So you can pick that first printing up if you, or if you still have it, I don't think it's available anymore, anywhere. Maybe uh, Noble Knight, maybe. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. still run the game with that first printing yep. and it all syncs over 20 years. There's been no significant I, changes other than the Barbarian and Monk. Yeah. I and just ran... I just ran Tomb of the Lizard King about three weeks ago in season six. And all I did was take the module and open it up. That's all I did for Christmas. So here, That's it. Here's, a dirty, here's another dirty secret for Castles and Crusades. We released dirty the secret. Handbook. Yeah, we released the player's handbook in 2005, January. I think we shipped for Christmas. I want to say in 04. I can't remember now, but I think the official release was, was 05. And the, the monster book, I'm not, it doesn't matter why, but it got log jammed in production for a while it was i think 2006 before the monster book the, the monsters and treasure came out and, it, and and we were getting so many complaints from people that i need the monster book we need the monster book that i started to get irritated and i never said it but what i wanted to say is listen just go to your shelf get your advanced dungeons and dragons monster <laughs> <laughs> you're golden right there <laughs> it's already published yeah so you already have it 
but I, I didn't say that. I have to say though, this <laughs> this cover, I just it's my it's probably my favorite of the trilogy, just because mm -hmm. I like the old one because I grew up with it. You know, I started in '76, but this is beautiful. It is it's just such a say, good. You know, I am stunned when that cover released. We first released the Player's Handbook homage, and then we did the CKG, and yeah. they got so much love that we weren't actually going to do the homage to the the monster book. It wasn't in the in the cards. So many people asked for it. I, I called Jason and said, yeah, absolutely, I'll do it. And he did it. I was floored because as a kid back in the, the 80s, in the late 70s, the Player's Handbook by a stretch yes. was, I thought, a better. I mean, I love that cover with the, the jewels. Oh, the, yeah, the, yeah, for sure. Fantastic. But the amount of love that that monster, the original Monster Manual cover got was, I was stuck. We, it was we, really how many things? We ordered, we ordered, what, three, four, five prints? I mean, we just kept having to reorder it. Oh nuts. yeah, yeah. No, we've had to reprint the fifth printing three times now. So it's insane. It, yeah. yeah. So yeah. whatever, it was, we could not keep that thing in stock. It's good. Good book. It's great. It's good stuff. Anyway, any final thoughts? Anybody would like to uh, toss that out there? So I, I would like to throw out that, uh, and we've we've mentioned this a number of times, and it and it bears repeating that uh, the the IP rests with the estate manager at the at the moment. And for all of the stuff that we want to see happen, we have we have to show the estate manager and the, the courts and whoever beyond that this is a very very viable IP. So please, if you if you can, go out and support it. Even if you don't purchase it, you know, get on your socials and let everybody know this is what's happening. Uh, and so that the greater strength we can show the estate manager for this stuff, the far better chance we have to get more of it out. And I will say this: we hit. You know, Luke and I talked about this a, a month or so ago. We hit the 120 day mark that I had that I had set down. This is what we can do in 90 days. This is what we can do in 120 days. We hit the 90 day mark within 20 hours, yeah. uh, and we are about to hit the 120 day mark. So we are. It is doing absolutely fantastic. The gaming community is absolutely up in arms and 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 carrying this beyond the finish line. Uh, but the the greater strength and like Luke mentioned, there's there's debts that have to be squared that. Uh, faster we can do this the better the better for us all i would i would like to apologize to the community at large luke and my brother for uh for what's going to happen as i get excited about these projects <laughs> oh, i know what's coming yeah. as I, I i intend to, i i have a tendency to jump the shark a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah just a little bit <laughs> so as i get excited i may put, i might post some crazy stuff on the castles and crusades group <laughs> Uh, on Facebook. As I oh, yeah. Did, uh, two days prior to uh, the official announcement. It's okay. It's not a big. Luke, thank you for championing. As your long father. as they're not dirty secrets, that's all that matters. No, there's no dirty secrets. <laughs> but, but seriously, I'm so glad you're out there fighting for your father, honestly. Someone has to represent the history of this game. Someone has yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was, it, you know, I it was my dad. So I grew up with him. Besides, playing games and, and, and seeing all those all that sort of stuff he's also the guy who's, who's like hey get the dishes done clean your room you know mow the lawn right he was my pop so uh, i saw him in that light uh throughout my life and i of course i enjoyed gaming it's what we did and i knew he was a great game designer what i didn't realize is how much he'd changed the world through dungeons and dragons yeah. uh and how revolutionary it was and how those concepts impacted others helped them and all the you know all the positive aspects that role-playing games i uh, had in you know, the things that he did were impacted directly tens of millions of lives and probably billions of people right. worldwide indirectly, right? You know, through uh, video you know, games. just look yeah, at video games and authors and movies, etc. right? So when he, and I realized that after he passed away and people started reaching out and telling the story of what D&D &D meant to them and why the loss, why my dad passing impacted them and made them pause and go wow this is a person who i didn't know and yet through his game i overcame a learning disability or absolutely wh wh whatever the, those situations were as well as the fact that he mentored i don't know hundreds of game designers in his lifetime you know and just encouraged so many people he was prolific on forum sites and you know, he would keep in contact with postcards and, and letters to people right. way back in the day you know, if he, he spotted he spotted a kid, a 13 year old boy, in line waiting for a signature. When he came up to him, he saw that he was in some kind of you know distress, and his parents are going through a divorce. The kid was having a bad time, right? He said, "Hey, just uh, have a seat right there." And then he would chat with him as he was signing other people's books. And then he hung out and he got his. I mean, he, he said, "Yeah, hey, I will send you some 
I'll send you some gifts and whatever. And he kept in touch with him. That that he would do that sort of thing, not on you know regularly, right? When he would when he would see that this person, you know, now helps me with GaryCon and told me that story. It's like this was impactful to me, you know. So now directly and indirectly, he just influenced so many people, and I feel really honored to be part of that legacy and be able to carry that forward um, and be someone who heralds the positive aspects of role-playing games. So That's it's awesome. really a, a, an honor and a pleasure. I think, I think Gary, I like, to, okay, this is how I think of Gary. Uh, he's like that crazy uncle that everyone loves that would take you on wild adventures or, you know, do, th do things just like uh, insane. And that's how Gary was to millions and millions of people. He was the crazy uncle that everyone just loved and who had a great influence on their lives. Yeah. yeah. And he was, he was, he was, uh, I, I tell you, my, I, I taught school for 15 years and I actually used, you know, D and D and on CNC to teach at risk kids for 10 of those years. And I'm telling you such a great tool and all because of, what he came up with, you know? So you can't, you can't, you can't go on and on. You, you can't stop talking about how beneficial it's been in the world. So, you know, when, when he passed, one of the phone calls I got was uh, that morning was from one of the VPs of development at Sony entertainment. Uh, and he called just to express his condolences and he was in charge of the video game side of things. And he, in a very tearful phone conversation was, you know, everything we do here is because of Gary. So, it was it was a pretty cool you know moment of clarity uh, for who he was. Right. When I knew him mostly because he, he liked to drink. What is that drink? Look, I can't slip of it. Slip of it. Yes, yes. And, have, and, yeah. and have good food and talk about history. And we argued about the King Kong movie. He didn't like the Peter. <laughs> <laughs> the new, yeah. He didn't like the new the old King Kong. We'd watch that one. He showed right. yeah. that one, the black and white yeah. one with Fay Ray and all that. We he yeah, had Monster that Island and all I, that. On video cassette, you know, when the old top loaded, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and we had a, we had a really cool projection TV with a remote control on a wire. That's how. Oh, it was. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> fancy. That's right there. It was fancy. It was that was that was cutting uh, edge. Yeah, yeah, it was cutting edge technology. Back in the day, yeah. Are you kids with your cell phones? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just getting grognardy for a while. Get off my lawn. Uh, <laughs> But no, this is great. I mean, we're, I'm so happy. It's been just a long road to get here. Uh, if you love, uh, you know, gaming and you want to uh, come in and kind of bask in uh, uh, the glow of, uh, you know, a very special event, I would suggest coming to either GaryCon uh, in March, March 21st through 24th. Uh, you can find, get badges there. We still have 600 or so left at play.garycon.com. Lots of information on GaryCon. And then uh, since it's the 50th year next year, I'm holding a much smaller, more intimate event. Not that GaryCon isn't. GaryCon's maybe 3,000 people. Yeah. I'm doing Founders and Legends before that. Uh, probably, may, I think we're up at 200 people right now, but maybe it'll be 400 by the time it, it comes around right there at the Grand Geneva, March 16th through 18th. So you can come to Founders and Legends, do some hang out in Lake Geneva for a day and a half, and then go and roll into GaryCon if, if you would like, or do either one. They're discrete events. They're not they're not together. Uh, so foundersandlegends.com uh, and you can figure out how to get tickets there. But that's going to be pretty much exclusively, I mean, I shouldn't say exclusively, primarily reflective and saluting the roots of the hobby, playing OD&D, AD d Classic Traveler, Call of Cthulhu First Edition, stuff like that. Uh, they're with, gosh, I think I got 25 guests who are showing up anywhere from Ed Greenwood and Zeb Cook and Earl Otis to, uh, gosh, uh, Kelsey Dion on the newer mm -hmm. side. Uh, so lots and lots of people uh, come and hang out, have a have a beer with us if you'd like, and uh, shake dice. Sweet. All right, I think uh, I think we've covered all the bases, eh? I think so. Yeah, it's good interview. Yeah, it's so. good. It's good. And a big thank you to David Chenault, Stephen Chenault, Chuck Combo, and Luke Gygax for joining me and uh, solidifying some very interesting information about some Gary Gygax creations that are going to be returning to print from Troll Lord Games. And of course, stay tuned to the Gaming Gang channel as well as thegaminggang.com for more news about these developments. 
All right, that is it for this time out. If you like the video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, don't forget, ring that bell. Because not only will it inform you when I upload videos such as these interviews, it'll also let you know when my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs live Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you will not find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer, and until I see you next time, here's hoping you get to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. Thank you.